For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Because we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even so, we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Before we open God's word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his guidance and direction on our study this morning. Father, we're so thankful for your word, that it, your word is that which enlightens us. Our soul has been enlightened so that we can understand the truth of your word from the instant of our salvation. And now we pray, as Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, that you would help us to understand more fully this revelation that you have given us in Ephesians that we might grow and mature as believers, that we might come to understand more fully all of these spiritual blessings that you have given us, and that as we learn about them, that God the Holy Spirit would use that to move us, to motivate us to greater diligence in our biblical study and application and spiritual growth, that we might fulfill the ministry that you have given to us and that you might be glorified. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles this morning with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. As we get into this second chapter of Ephesians, we begin in the first ten verses with one of the most significant passages for salvation in all of the New Testament. It is loaded with fascinating explanations and it is filled with brief statements assuming that the reader has a background for understanding all of these different statements. We find phrases such as dead in trespasses and sins, the prince and the power of the air, that we are made alive together, we are raised together, and we are seated together in Christ. And not very many of us have too much of an understanding of the implications of each of those phrases. We are told that this is due to the grace and the mercy of God. What does that mean? How are we to understand those terms and the distinctions between those terms? We understand that we are saved by grace and not through faith, and that this is the gift of God, but what is the gift of God? Is it grace? Is it salvation? Is it faith? And then in verse 10, we are told that we are created for good works. Who's the we? What are these good works? What are we supposed to do about that? All of those demand some further explanation. This passage is also a battleground for legalism. Because of its emphasis on grace and not works, it shows that our works are not relevant to salvation. But there is a role for works, apparently, according to verse 10. It is a battleground in the false teaching of lordship salvation. For there are things that are said in lordship salvation that are genuinely contradicted in this passage, but there are those who hold to those views who twist and distort some things that are in this passage. It is also a passage that will give clarity in the ongoing debate between Calvinists and Arminians. As Calvinists teach that faith or the, excuse me, that regeneration precedes faith. And they have a statement that dead people can't believe, so therefore 
they must be regenerated before they can believe. So we need to talk about these things. But above all, as we look at this passage, what we see is that its focus is on being saved. And being saved means that the dead are made alive. That's the heart of the passage. God makes the dead alive again. So we need to understand exactly what that means. What does it mean to be dead? And what is this life that we are giving? So what I want to do this morning is I want to cover the first 10 verses. We want to do this in sort of an overview fashion. And then over the course of the next two or three weeks, we will look at the different sections of this passage to get more understanding on some of those issues that I have just, just mentioned. But it's important, first of all, to understand sort of the overview, the structure, think through what Paul is saying together. And that in and of itself will clarify a number of these points of, of, of contention and points that are argued among uh, theologians and some things that perhaps you have been taught but wrongly. So here in this first slide, what I've done is I've just put the first seven verses up here. It's hard to crowd all ten in there, but we want to focus on the first seven because these first seven are really one sentence in the Greek. But if you're looking at your Bible, for example, if you have a New King James translation, what you will see is in the first verse it says, and you he made alive. And that phrase he made alive is in italics. That means it's not in the original Greek of that verse. But the writers uh, are the translators of the uh, New King James Version and the King James Version before it put this there in order to give more clarity for the English reader. Because in the Greek, the main subject of this long sentence is down in verse 4. But if you look at the way these seven verses are punctuated in the New King James, there's a period at the end of verse 3 which suggests that there is a subject and finite verb in the first part, and it's not there. The subject is, of course, God, but God at the beginning of verse 4. That's the subject of this whole sentence. It's talking about something God has done for us. And the first thing that it says that God did for us is that he made us alive. So that is taken by the translators, and it's put up into the beginning in verse 1 so that it makes more sense to the, to the English reader. To the reader who is looking at the Greek text, you don't get to the main idea till you get down to verse 4, and so you're trying to figure out, well, what do those first three verses mean? Where is he going with this? What is this all about? And he is expanding on the, this uh, fact that we are all, Jew and Gentile, born dead in our trespasses and sins. We are spiritually dead, we often say, but we need to understand why it is that we, uh, that we say that. And so as we look at this, we have to sort of repunctuate it a little bit. And I've taken that paragraph out of verse 4 because there's no new paragraph there. The reason you know it's all one sentence is because the subject of the, of the finite verbs that are there in verse four, 4 and 5, that we were made alive together, we were raised together, or rather 5 and 6, we were made alive together, raised together, and seated together, in the heavenlies. That's your, that's your main clause here. But God made us alive together with Christ, raised us up together, and made us sit together. Everything else relates in a sort of a secondary explanatory way to help us understand the significance of that main statement and that main verse. And then the other thing that we're going to see as we look at this, is that as he is saying, God made us alive together, there's this parenthetical phrase here, by grace you have been saved. Now what happens is he introduces that idea here in verse 5, and it's a critical idea. 
And then he picks it up again at the beginning of one of our favorite verses, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. He picks that up and gives a fuller explanation of what that means in verses 8 and 9, and then what the results of that are for are to be for us when we get to verse, verse 10. So that sets things up for us to understand what's going on here. So let's look at this. I'm going to look at this in terms of six basic questions that we'll answer in the next 30 or 40 minutes. First of all, we need to understand that there's a problem. So what is the problem? And in order to understand the problem as Paul is stating it in the first three verses, we first have to recognize that there's a distinction between verses 1 and 2 and verse 3. In verses 1 and 2, he's talking about y'all and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. It's a plural. So it's y'all. Who are the y'all? And then in verse 3, he shifts to we, and it also, we were all, we, and, <clears throat> excuse me, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. Who's the we? And why is that important to understand this distinction? Then the second question is what's the solution? The first three verses identify the problem. Verses 4 through 6 identify the solution. That God made us alive together, raised us together, seated us together. We need to understand who the together are. If you're following closely, the together pulls together the you and the we. So now they together experience this grace of God. The third question is, what does it mean to be saved? As it is stated in Ephesians 2.5 and then picked up again and restated in verse 8. What does it mean to be saved contextually? Fourth, what is the purpose of for being made alive, raised, and seated. We we're made alive together, raised together, and seated together. The purpose for that is stated in verse 7. And then the fifth question is, what is the gift of God in 2.8? Is it grace? Is it faith? Is it salvation? What is it? A lot of discussion and debate over that. And then the sixth Question is, who is God's masterpiece? Now you're looking around, you're going, I don't have that word in my Bible. That's a better translation of the word that is translated workmanship. And we'll look at that when we get there in uh, 2.10. So we'll start with the problem. The problem, first of all, for y'all, who are the y'all? What is that second person plural, to what does that second person plural refer? And what about the we? So, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, let me read that for you. And y'all, notice I put in ellipses there because we're going to take out that phrase that is moved up from Ephesians 2, 5. And that's fine. It, it's a good way to translate it, but we're just going to catch the sense of this. Y'all, who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which y'all once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Then Paul says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Okay, so who's the we? This is important to understand that, but first of all, we see this contrast. It goes back to, verse, to chapter 1. The y'all refers to Gentiles. Always through Ephesians, it refers to Gentiles. Sometimes it might refer to, as it does here, what they were before they were saved, so it refers to Gentile unbelievers. But now the y'all refers to them as believers. They are now believers, but it has sometimes a reference back to what they were before they became believers. 
So this distinction is, is held. It's very clear in the second part of chapter 2. But it is, there's nothing to indicate the meaning changes. So Paul is still talking about this distinction that we refers to Jews, the y'all refers to the Gentiles, and that in the new body of Christ, the, the y'all and the we are going to now be one in the body of Christ. That is foundational to this whole epistle. It's about the body of Christ. It has that corporate significance. Too often, we jump to make these statements personal in terms of individuals. That's what I was dealing with in the first chapter in those controversial passages that are often taken to mean election and predestination, at, and they're taken as individual references, but in the context of this epistle, Paul is talking about what we as a corporate body have. And so that's why we spent so much time. I realized today that we spent a year just going through the first chapter. Someone told me as we were starting that, he said, be careful. A lot of people have gone into the quicksand of chapter one and been there forever. And I can understand that because it takes so much time, if you're diligent, to read and study and work through the issues and not just assume that whatever your favorite commentator has said is accurate. You have to really work at it. So that's what we have come to here. So initially in these first two, two verses, Paul is talking about the, the Gentiles, what they were before they were saved. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. Now, what does that mean, to be dead in your trespasses and sins? Obviously, he's writing to them. He expects them to read this epistle, so he is assuming that they are physically alive. So we recognize that there's a number of different ways in which the term dead is used in Scripture, but here it is used in reference to trespasses and sins but he is writing to those who are physically alive. Now, you have to understand a little bit about what Calvinists argue here when they inter interpret this. They will in not interpret this in the way that we do in terms of spiritual death because they have something of an issue with that, and so they sort of sidestep it. They will use the term spiritual death at times, but it becomes less clear and so we need to explain that. What Calvinists do, and the first time I heard about this, a roommate of mine back when I was in my first year at seminary went to a Baptist church in Dallas, and there was a revival, revivalist there preaching, and he went to John 11 and the resurrection, resuscitation of Lazarus. And when he got there, he made the point, made the application that he said, Lazarus had to have already been made alive so he could hear the call and then come out of the grave. That's the same way with regeneration. We have to be made alive first before we can respond to the gospel. So regeneration precedes faith. And you will hear a lot of Calvinists who will take that position. We're going to show in this passage why that is exegetically impossible. But we have to define dead here. And what they do is they make the mistake, it's a logical fallacy, where they confuse aspects of physical death with spiritual death. Physical death for many means cessation of existence. But we learn that in the scripture that the main idea in death is not the cessation of existence, it is separation. And so when we read this phrase, dead in trespasses and sins, we need to let the Bible define what that is. And we see that in Ephesians. Let Paul de define his terms. And I want to start in Ephesians 4.17 to give us a little context. And there Paul says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord that y'all, talking to the Greeks, regenerate Greeks, that y'all should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles. That's assuming that a saved person can live just like an unsaved Gentile. That count, that's a counter to lordship salvation. Uh, un, the saved people can be just as bad, if not worse, just as evil, and not worse, a, 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 if not worse, as unbelievers. Y'all should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. And then there's three phrases. 
in the futility of their mind, and second, having their understanding darkened. So there he's referring to the unsaved Gentile. And then that next phrase is being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. So this is talking about them as being, being unsaved. Now, the word there that is translated being alienated is apolatriao, which is a perfect passive participle. Now, that grammar is important because a perfect tense means it's completed action in the past. So that alienation happened in the past, and it was completed in the past, but the focus is on the present result of the completed past action. So sometime in the past, they are alienated, and this word alienated has the idea of being estranged or being separated. And so what we see here is that Paul is talking about this spiritual death as being a separation from the life of God. Therefore, they are able to have volition. See, in, in the Calvinist concept, they can't express positive volition to anything. They can't do anything because they're spiritually dead. They, I mean, they're, because they're, they're incapable, in their definition of death, of believing, of exercising positive volition, of just doing anything because they're dead. Dead men can't do anything, so they have to be made alive before they can do something. But that is not how Paul defines spiritual death. It is a condition where the spiritually dead person is separated or estranged from the life of God. He is dead spiritually because he doesn't have God's life. Now, Ephesians 2.12 uses this in the same way and says that at that time, y'all, that is Jews, that is before the cross, in this context, were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, when they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, could they still think? Could they still make decisions? Could they still do certain things? Certainly. So as that estrangement, that alienation, is not a state of non-existence or inability. We'll take a little time next week talking about these phrases that are used, inability of man and the total depravity of man. And in Calvinism, it is an inability. You can't do anything as a dead person. That does not fit the context. So we go back to Ephesians 2.2. Where it is expanded on this spiritual death condition, in which, that is, in that spiritual death condition, y'all, you Gentiles, once walked according to the course of this world, and that simply means according to the standards of the cosmic system. I spell that with a K. It's how it's all of human viewpoint. It's how the world lives apart from God and apart from Christ. And second, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan. We'll deal with those phrases a little more in a little more detail later on. And according to, and then you have an appositional phrase defining who the prince of the power of the air is. He is the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, who are the sons of disobedience? Again, another very important phrase. And according to Ephesians 5, 6 and Colossians 3, 6, sons of disobedience refers to unbelievers. It does not ever refer to believers. It's used three times in the New Testament, and every time it refers to unbelievers. And in Ephesians 5, 6, coming from the same epistle, Paul uses it again and says, let no one deceive y'all, that is you Gentile believers, with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Colossians 3, 6 states almost the same phrase. Wrath of God is the divine discipline of God, according to Romans 1, 18 and following, on the unbelieving world. So those who are recipients of the wrath of God in this, this context are unbelievers. Now that's an important point to remember. Now what we have seen is that the we equals the Jews. Paul can use it, we Jews, 
in terms of before salvation or we Jews in terms of those early Jews that were saved in the first chapters of Acts. And here it refers, of course, to Jewish unbelievers. He says, among whom also we, we Jews. So in the first two verses, he's talking about you Gentiles are spiritually dead, and this is all the things that you're doing, but we also. So he's adding the Jews. We have the same problem. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh. The term lust of the flesh there refers specifically to the lust, and then it's parallel term for uh, the, desires, um, the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That is a parallel term indicating will or desire, and it's parallel to, and it's often a synonym of lust. So as Jewish unbelievers, we were living on the basis of the lust of our sin nature and the desires of our sin nature and our mind. And we were, I added the we there, but that's in the text, we Jews were by nature children of wrath. Now that's why I emphasize this verse in Ephesians 5, 6, that as unbelievers, they receive the wrath of God. Those who receive the wrath of God are Jewish unbelievers as well. They're children of wrath. That connects them to the Gentiles. They're recipients of God's wrath. And he, just to make sure we don't lose the point, he says, just as, and literally, it's the rest that refers to the Gentiles. So he makes this comparison. Gentiles are spiritually dead. Jews are spiritually dead. That is our problem. But what is the solution? The solution begins in Ephesians 2.4 and takes us down through verse 6. And it starts by putting the emphasis on God. Now, little grammatical point, but it's important. God's the subject of these verbs. God made us alive together. God raised us up together. God made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, when you look at that, there's a phrase at the end of verse 5 that is a parenthetical phrase. What's the purpose of a parenthetical phrase? It is used to explain something that has already been saved, to say something in addition to or to explain it a little bit. And so he is pointing out in that parenthetical phrase that when we are made alive together in Christ, it is by grace. Okay, so that explains that. But when he says this, he says, by grace, you have been saved. Have been saved is a passive. Now you shift from active verbs to a passive verb because that is showing that we don't have anything to do with our salvation. God is the one who saves us. He is the one who makes us alive together. So the solution is that God, first, makes us alive together. Second, he raises us together. Third, he saves us together. So now when he comes to this verse, he's using this first-person plural pronoun of us. He has shifted from using first-person plural to refer to we Jews to now referring to us Jew and Gentile together in the body of Christ. This is the first time we've seen that. So he said, you Gentiles are spiritually dead. We Jews are children of wrath. But the solution is that God has made us together alive, made us together raised, made us together seated. Okay, that's the focus, is the together. So... Looking at that parenthetical phrase, by grace we have been saved, we need to ask the question, what does it mean in context to be saved? Don't read your definition into this. Don't say, well, that means to be justified. Where do you find justification in the passage? That means to be reconciled. Where do you find reconciliation in the passage? What does the passage say? 
Let's look at it again. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together, for by grace you have been saved. That parenthetical phrase is explaining what it means to be made alive together. Contextually, salvation here equals being made alive together. Okay? Now, you may have another, other versions. I think this is the um, uh, ESV has an M dash. That's a longer dash. But it's stating the same thing. It's an appositional or explanatory phrase to help us understand the previous phrase. So made alive equals, made alive together equals regeneration, which means to be born again. And that equals being saved. Now this is very important because when we get down to verse 8, it starts talking about, for by grace you have been saved. What does that mean? Contextually, it means you've been regenerated. Okay, so we're just going to play a little word substitution as we go through here. Made alive together equals regeneration. Regeneration equals being saved. So let's flip it. Being saved then, in Ephesians 2.8, means regeneration. It means being made alive together. So you could read that, for by grace you have been regenerated through faith. So, we need to, we'll come back to that. I'm not done with 2.8 yet. We have to look at verse 7, which states the purpose for being made alive, being raised, and being seated, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we'll need to talk about what's grace and what's kindness when we look at this, but the main idea here is we become, as church-age believers, united together in Christ, brilliant trophies of God's grace. The spotlight is on us to illuminate all that God has done for us in grace. We become a trophy of grace so that we are used as examples and testimonies to those in future ages. That we, not Old Testament saints, Moses isn't going to have anything to do with this. Abraham won't have anything to do with this. Elijah won't have anything to do with this. John the Baptist, who's the greatest of Old Testament prophets according to Jesus, won't have anything to do with this. We, as church-age believers, are exemplary trophies of grace in the future for God's use in teaching others about his grace. So then that brings us to the big question, what is the gift of God in Ephesians 2.8? So what we have seen here is that by grace, that means by means of God's unmerited favor, his goodness to those who don't deserve it, You have been saved. It's a perfect tense, which indicates past completed action. It's talking to the Gentiles, specifically y'all, have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So this salvation is through faith. That means grammatically that it must precede salvation, And salvation in this passage is regeneration. So grammatically, faith cannot come before regeneration because regeneration is through faith. Let me give you a little graphic illustration. This is a water pipe. The water pipe is labeled faith. We are saved through faith. So something comes through faith. What comes through faith? What comes through faith is the water of life, which is a metaphor used throughout the Gospel of John. There's a valve here, and that's the volition valve. When the volition valve is turned off, no water comes through to our poor little spiritually dead, parched unbeliever here who has no water. He, this symbol here represents the spiritually dead sinner who separated from the life of God, which is the water of life. What happens is, 
when he turns the volition valve on, the water of life flows through faith. But what has to happen? First volition, then the water through faith, and then he receives the water of life. So it's very clear grammatically that faith precedes regeneration, not the other way around. You can't break the grammar. It is impossible. So faith comes before life. First you have to have volition to turn the water on. Then you believe, and it is through that faith that you receive the water of life. Now, when we get into the text itself, what we read is, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, the question is, what is the that? Um, is it faith? Typo there. Is it faith? What's the it? It is the gift of God. What is that? That refers back to the same thing. It refers back to grace. Is grace the gift of God? Is salvation the gift of God? Is faith the gift of God? Now you will find many in the Lordship camp, many who are strong Calvinists, that say faith is the gift of God, which makes saving faith a different kind of faith than any other faith. You got up this morning, and or last night you went to bed, you set your alarm, you had faith your alarm would go off this morning. That's the same kind of faith we exercise to believe. It's the object is different. The merit is not in the kind of faith we have. The merit is in the Savior that we are trusting in, the object of faith. So, the pronoun that is a neuter pronoun. It's a demonstrative pronoun. It's in the neuter gender. And the Holy Spirit is not gender confused. So he is using this to make a very clear point. That is a new. So that means that that to which the demonstrative pronoun refers must be of the same gender. Grace and faith are in the feminine gender. So you can't use a neuter pronoun to refer to a feminine antecedent. So that excludes grace as being the gift, and it excludes faith as being the gift. The word saved is a masculine participle, so it's not referring to saved either. So to what does it refer? In Greek, when you have a clause or a phrase or a sentence or a book or any lengthy piece of literature, it is re always referred to through a neuter pronoun. You're not referring to one word or another word. You're referring to the whole phrase or the whole clause. It's introduced in verse 5. It is repeated here. And what this means is, for by grace you have been saved. That's the f uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's the phrase. That is the referent of the word that, that demonstrative pronoun. So it should be translated something like this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that by grace through faith salvation is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is that by grace through faith salvation, it refers to the whole thing. So it's, it's talking about this whole salvation package you get is by the grace of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. My computer just went dead. Okay. I have a power cord right here. Yep. That should... Will that do it? Yep. That'll come back on in a minute. So we are saved, this by grace through faith salvation is the gift of God for us. And then the passage goes on into verse 10. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is in those good works that should characterize our, our spiritual life. 
Now, when we get to that last part, this is describing the purpose that God has for us as believers. And it's interesting how this is translated. The word that is translated in, um, in the Greek is a word based on what that which is done. Poieo is the main, main verb, and this is a, um, this is a noun, noun here. Let me see if I can pull the slide up for you. There we go. That was simple. It's poema. Now, what? That's not working either. Oh well. Let's see if we can reacquire that. If not, anyway, it is the noun poema, and it's usually translated as a work of creation. There we go, and or something else. I gave you a couple of examples here, real quick. In Ephesians. Uh, 2.9, the Lexham English Bible, it says, for we are his creation, we're his work. That's not bad. It loses the thrust of it, though. Workmanship is just an antiquated idea. What does that mean? In the contemporary English version, they get it right. The best way to understand this word is either as a masterpiece or a work of art. It elevates the concept quite a bit. For we are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared long ago to be our way of life. That's a really good translation. The Living Bible is a really bad translation. I would give it an F minus. It is God himself who has made us what we are. What does that mean? That's about as nebulous a statement as you can find. Okay, now who's the we here? For we are his workmanship. Well, since verse 4, the we refers to we in the body of Christ. We, Jew and Gentile, together in the body of Christ. It's a corporate term. Many of us have always heard this apply to you individually. You are his workmanship. That is not what this says. We... The body of Christ, Jew and Gentile together, are his masterpiece. That's why you have verse 7 that talks about how we are the trophy of his grace. What do you hear from the Lordship crowd on this? Lordship crowd takes it individually. You're his workmanship created for good works. That's God's purpose. God always accomplishes his purpose. So if I don't see any good works in your life, then maybe you're not saved. That's how they take it. That's not what it's saying. It's we as the body of Christ are the workmanship. And that becomes evident when we are his bride in heaven. And all sin, all carnality has been expunged and we're glorified and we will be the examples, the trophies of grace for all the future ages. So that is the challenge before us. And so when we look at this passage, we come to the conclusion that the main points are first of all that God makes dead people alive. They are spiritually dead, which means they are separated from him. He makes them alive through faith alone in Christ Jesus alone. Not any other way. Faith is the means and each individual has to make that decision for themselves and trust in Christ. He makes them alive for the purpose of serving him in the good works of the church, the body of Christ. So next time we'll come back and we'll start tearing the passage apart a little bit and looking at some of the important statements that are made here and their implication and application for us. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to go through this passage to be reminded of the greatness of the body of Christ the greatness that you have given to the church, that you have blessed us all in the church with these spiritual blessings, that we are the ones who have been appointed to a particular ministry. We are the ones who have been elevated to a position uh, where we will be trophies of your grace for all eternity to the ages and beyond. Father, we are thankful for this, and we need to learn to live in the light of this new identity. 
that we are a work of art. Corporately, the body of Christ is a masterpiece. It's a work of art. It is something that is that will outshine all other uh, people, of, all the other peoples of God, and will are the beneficiaries of incredible grace and blessings. Father, we need to be challenged that that should impact how we think about ourselves and how we live. Father, we thank you too for our salvation, that it is a by grace through faith salvation, not by works, lest any man should boast. We pray that if there's anyone listening to this message, anyone here who's never trusted Christ as Savior, that they would understand that it's not how you live your life, it's not where you go to church, it's not any particular ritual, it's not how good you are or how bad you've been, it is faith in Christ Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. When we trust in Christ, we're given his life. We're made alive together with him. We're given his righteousness, and we are declared to be justified. And it's on that basis that we have eternal life, not on the basis of anything we have done. And the way to make that ours is through the pipeline of faith. Through faith, we receive the water of life. And Father, for these things, we, we express our profound gratitude for all that you've done for us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing.